Welcome to the first episode in a Legendarium series called Rome's Great Crisis. In this first episode, Year of the Six Emperors, we will talk about the Severan Dynasty and how it fell after the murder of Alexander Severus. Afterwards, a new kind of emperor named Maximinus Thrax seized power, and while he was very successful in wars against the Germans, his brutal tax policies led to a revolt back home. Traditionally, many historians mark the reign of Commodus from 180 to 192 AD as the beginning of the end of the Roman Empire. While Commodus surely deserves to be remembered as a monster and a madman, the empire enjoyed two generations of stability after his death, and ironically, the dynasty which provided the stability, the Severans, also laid the foundations for later disasters. Septimius Severus, the man who eventually replaced Commodus, ruled from 193 to 212 AD. He had much in common with the barracks emperors of the 3rd century. Septimius Severus despised the Senate and the senatorial classes, and relied upon the army both as an instrument of conquest and a political power base. Many of his new recruits came from outside the borders of the empire, including Parthia and Germania, where the Severans fought wars. In part to win the support of the military, Septimius gave the Roman army its first raise in a hundred years, moving their annual wage from 300 to 500 sesterces. To pay for these increases, Septimius lowered the value of the currency, putting less precious metal into coins. While this did not have immediate effects, it set a dangerous example. Indeed, Septimius's son Caracalla gave the army another raise to 900 sesterces to buy their loyalty. Julia Mamea, a sovereign woman who ruled the empire during the reign of her weak-willed son Alexander from 222 to 235 AD, realized that devaluing the currency had caused inflation, so she cut back on the army's pay raises. However, given that the army had grown more politically powerful and more numerous, this was a dangerous game for her to play. Disaster might have been prevented if Alexander Severus proved to be a strong ruler, but he did not. When Germanic tribes began raiding the northern border in 235 AD, Alexander Severus and his mother Julia headed north. Any remaining respect the troops had for their emperor vanished when he passed the time with chariot racing, and then the legionaries learned that Alexander intended to pay off the Germans rather than fight. Already fed up with the pay cuts, the soldiers looked for a new emperor. They found one in Gaius Julius Verus, born around 172 AD in Thrace, a region northeast of Macedonia. The son of a peasant father and an Alonic mother, he became known as the big man from Thrace, or Maximinus Thrax. In 190 AD, he entered the military, part of the beginning of the wave of barbarian recruitment carried out during the Severan era. Because of his immense size and strength, Maximinus quickly rose through the ranks, becoming a legionary commander in Egypt in 232 AD, governor of Mesopotamia, and finally commandant of the Roman armies on the German border. Not wishing to appear ambitious during the crisis, Maximinus Thrax stage-managed his coronation. He walked out of his tent one morning, and as planned, his soldiers draped the purple cloak of Imperium around his shoulders and hailed him emperor. Of course, Maximinus pretended to be surprised and asked them to reconsider, but after much begging, he feigned reluctant acceptance. The rebel army moved fast against Alexander Severus, who camped at Vicus Britannicus. When Alexander learned of Maximinus Thrax's betrayal, he began weeping and trembling, raving against the Thracian commander. Likely unimpressed, his men sided with the rebels. Alexander Severus was slaughtered by Maximinus's men while clutching at his mother's skirts. 
With his last words, he blamed her for his fate. And to see my series on the Severan Dynasty, follow the link in the description. The new Emperor Maximinus Thrax was a new kind of Roman ruler. He was a self-made man from a poor family and came from a province seen as semi-barbarian. He could barely read or write. The Roman Senate, loathing the thought of being ruled by a mere plebeian, organized a conspiracy among high-born army officers. Soon after killing Alexander, Maximinus Thrax prepared to lead his troops into Germania. After he finished building a pontoon bridge from boats lashed across the Rhine River, the conspirators plotted to destroy the bridge and strand Maximinus in enemy territory. Instead, Maximinus learned of the conspiracy and executed its leaders without trial. He then crossed the Rhine River during the summer of 235 AD and spent the rest of the year moving deep into Germania, plundering and burning villages as he went. After a fierce battle near Württemberg and Baden, he was proclaimed Germanicus Maximus in honor of his victories, despite the heavy losses taken by his army. During 236 AD, Maximinus advanced towards the Danube River and won further victories. However, to finance these successful campaigns, along with yet another pay raise for his army, Maximinus ordered his men to seize the estates of the senatorial aristocracy that he despised. More dangerously, Maximinus Thrax also cut the grain dole given to the poor people of Rome. He also seized funds being held in reserve for shows and festivals. In Maximinus's defense, by then rampant inflation had devalued the currency, which made portable wealth preferable to coins. Yet at least some of this wealth found its way into Maximinus's personal fortune, which cannot be defended and made it far easier to justify rebellion. By 238 AD, Maximinus had secured the German border, but he had too many enemies back in Rome to rule in peace. In the end, the rebellion started not in Italy or Rome, but the grain-rich province of North Africa. There, the landowners and merchants were hit especially hard by an enthusiastic procurator. A band of young aristocrats organized and murdered the procurator as he seized livestock. Then they approached the governor of the province and called upon him to take the purple. The governor, Marcus Gordianus, was then a man of 80 years. And after a stage-managed show of reluctance, similar to what Maximinus did three years ago, Marcus accepted and became Emperor Gordian I. He named his son co-emperor with the name Gordian II. The elder Gordian was an unlikely rebel, a rich man who was fond of literature and wrote well-regarded biographies of the emperors Antoninus Pius and Marcus Aurelius. Yet the Senate saw him as one of their own, a rich and cultured patrician, in sharp contrast to the low-born semi-barbarian Maximinus. The Senate happily proclaimed him emperor. Mobs went through the streets of Rome, killing Maximinus's tax collectors and supporters. News of the rebellion reached Maximinus in modern-day Bulgaria about 10 days later. Needless to say, Maximinus was not pleased. Ironically, as Maximinus headed towards Italy, the loyal governor of Numidia, a man named Capellianus, decided to settle an old score with the Gordians. In command of the only legion in Africa, Capellianus marched upon Carthage, power base of the Gordians. He easily crushed the local militias, and Gordian II died in the fighting. His father, Gordian I, upon learning of his son's death, hung himself. Their joint reign lasted only 20 days. That might have been the end of the Senate's rebellion. Instead, the senators, knowing full well that Maximinus would punish them for treason, they risked everything in a desperate gamble. The Senate met at the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus and named two senators joint emperors, a callback to the two consuls who led the Roman Republic in times of war, by then 300 years ago.
This dubious honor fell to Decius Caelius Balbinus and Marcus Claudius Pupienus. Both men were in their 70s, with long and distinguished careers behind them. However, they failed to count on the people, who saw them as nothing but stooges for the rich and the Gordians as champions of the poor. When Pupianus and Balbinus attempted to march in a parade, the mob showered the co-emperors with sticks and stones. Realizing they could not hold the city, the Senate sent for the 13-year-old grandson of the Gordian family to crown him Gordian III, junior emperor to Balbinus and Pupianus. This tactic of naming a more popular man Caesar or junior emperor was a common tactic among unpopular rulers. By February 238, Maximinus reached the borders of Italy. To his surprise, the garrison city of Aquila on the Adriatic coast organized resistance in defiance of his march. Maximinus began a siege, blocking the roads to starve out the city. The Italian soldiers within his army, including his own Praetorian guard, soon grew tired of waging war against their own countrymen. So they banded together, stormed into Maximinus's tent, stabbed him to death, and then tore apart the imperial portrait. They also murdered his son, 23-year-old Gaius Julius Maximus. The assassins took the heads of Maximinus and his son Gaius to Pupienus, who then tried to raise an army near Rome. With the war seemingly over, Pupienus sent the legions home and returned to Rome in triumph in the company of his Praetorian guard. However, the seemingly victorious Pupienus and Balbinus soon fell out with each other by arguing over who should take precedence. The Praetorians, who no longer respected the Senate and saw the army as the ultimate source of power, saw their opportunity. In May 238, they invaded the palace, seized the elderly emperors, tore off their clothes, and dragged them through the streets. They beat them up, ripped their hair and eyebrows out, and finally clubbed them to death. Their joint reign lasted only 99 days. The Praetorians named Gordian III only recently arrived in Rome, the new emperor. Given that Gordian III was only 13 years old at the time, power lay with the Praetorian Guard, led by Gaius Furius Tamsithius. For a time, the civil wars in Rome ended, though 238 was remembered as the year of the six emperors. Yet the events of 238 AD laid bare many weaknesses within the post-Severan Roman state. It showed that army commanders held the real power in Rome, and would happily use the military to advance their ambitions. The inflation of the 230s was never addressed, and the army was often unhappy as their pay bought less and less. During this first crisis, Maximinus had, for all his failings, kept peace on the northern frontier. Yet what would happen when fragile Rome faced stronger enemies better able to take advantage of the next crisis? We will find out in the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this installment of the Legendarium. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.